Okay, session 10. Father, we ask you again to enlarge our heart, accelerate our capacity to receive. Lord, we understand that our desire for you is your gift to us. Lord, enlarge it. Enlarge your gift to us, our desire for you. We know that our desire for you is an expression of your desire for us. So we ask you to enlarge it. In the name of Jesus, amen. Okay, session 10, a revelation of Jesus as a safe Savior. Again, you, you know that these uh, sessions are, there's more on them, on the handouts than obviously we can cover. And again, I'll say it maybe every time that the teaching session is just a mi- reading the menu. You can't really be fed in the real sense at a teaching meeting. You can have your appetite awakened and stirred. And I'm, I'm not saying it's impossible because obviously the Lord can, can do that. But let's say it this way. The greatest feeding is alone with the Lord. Taking the word and turn it into conversation with him. It's called meditation. I mean, you can be fed in a teaching meeting, but not at the deepest levels. Let's say it more accurately. You can be stirred, mostly, at a teaching meeting. You're fed in weeks and months of turning the Word of God into dialogue, into conversation. These principles become your very, your very dialogue from your heart, the very language of your heart with the Lord. And then the Holy Spirit feeds you in that context far greater than He feeds you even being inspired in a teaching meeting. And so the, the, the issue, the concept of these notes is to advertise them, to let you know some of the ideas that are in them. And the point is, you'll say, okay, I can't remember that much, but I remember that one point about having more of God. That's it. I'll go read the notes. That's the point of, of these sessions, is to uh, get you uh, just a little bit hooked up to the Song of Solomon, if you're brand new with it, and to uh, strengthen your desire for those of you that are familiar with it. And so I don't apologize for just, I just can barely go over just a few principles and, and leave you with some notes and leave you with the books, the textbooks. And there's a lot of books out there in the body of Christ on the Song of Solomon. Just read them. Make it a lifelong hobby. Make it your divine recreation. Okay, verse 6. Who is this coming out of the wilderness? Like pillars of smoke, perfumed with myrrh and frankincense, with all the merchants fragrant powders. Behold, it's Solomon's couch with 60 valiant men around it, all of the valiant of Israel. They all hold swords, being expert in war. Every man has his sword on his thigh because of fear in the night of the wood of Lebanon. Solomon the king made himself a palaquin or a chariot, a palaquin or a chariot, or a couch, or a, it's that chair that they would carry the, the king and the queen on, uh, especially the, uh, the royal wedding. The, the bride was carried on a palaquin. He made its pillars of silver, its support of gold, its seat of purple, its interior paved with love by the daughters of Jerusalem. Go forth, O daughters of Zion, and see the king, see King Solomon with the crown which his mother crowned him on the day of his wedding, on the day of the gladness of his heart. We see in verse 11 that the great king coming up in the wilderness is a king who is a bridegroom who's glad on his wedding day. He's a glad king. He's a bridegroom king filled with gladness on his wedding day. And that is uh, where the the romance of the gospel, I believe, finds its richest pinnacle is in the glad bridegroom king coming up for his people, bringing them to himself out of the wilderness. Before I I go any further, uh, there there was a word uh, that uh, Bill Barlow had uh, all throughout the day. The Lord was telling him, he said, tonight's going to be an impartation night more than even a teaching night. And so just open your spirit. I, I believe that, that that's a true word, that throughout the day he kept tugging him, saying, tonight's impartation come to be impacted in your spirit even more than in your understanding, though the two of them are related. Our mind is renewed is the way that God uh, renews our spirit. And so we don't want to separate the mind from the spirit. 
But he said sometimes the Spirit of God will just impact our spirit with his fragrance. And then our, our own dear Nick Syrett, in the morning when we were working on this, he goes, ministry time after the first session. I said, no. He goes, you wait and see. So uh, he has his uh, official first public prophecy as a Kansas City prophet here in Kansas City. <clears throat> okay. He was right. He said, it's going to happen. You wait and see. So he's one for one in the public format of prophesying. Here we go. Overview of Song of Solomon, session 3, verse 6 to 11. This is the fourth revelation of Jesus in the song. In this section, she teaches the daughters of Jerusalem her new discoveries of the safe leadership of Christ. Jesus' incarnation and death prove that he has our good in mind. That's the strength of what's going on. The fact that he has died to provide a way for a wedding proves that it's our good that he has in mind. 1 Corinthians 2, 9 says, I has not seen, ears not hear, heard. The things which God has prepared for us, that's the part that just, just so powerfully touches my heart. The things that God has prepared for us. He's prepared them for us. Not only for His own glory, of which certainly that is the, 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 the central motivation of, of the plan of the gospel. But He prepared them for us too. He died and planned a wedding. Therefore we know He is safe if He did that. The Holy Spirit asks a rhetorical question then gives a two-part answer. And then the young bride communicates this two-part answer of the Holy Spirit to the daughters of Jerusalem. The first answer, the Holy Spirit uses military language to reveal how safe the people of God are under Jesus' leadership. The second answer, the Holy Spirit uses the language of a royal wedding procession to reveal how safe the people of God are under Jesus' leadership. If he would die for us and plan a wedding for us, then how safe are we in his hands is the idea. We are perfectly safe in a God that would die for us and to plan a wedding and to choose us as his wedding partner and then to plan the wedding. Then she exhorts the daughters of Jerusalem to press into Jesus in the light of his glorious redemption and his excellent leadership. In verse 11, he, uh, she says, See the king crowned on his wedding day. She is exhorting the daughters to see the king, the powerful one who's so glad and so happy that you are there on the wedding day to marry you. He's so glad, not just about being married, he's glad about you. He's glad about his bride, not just the fact of a ceremony. He's glad about the person in the ceremony, you. A king, see him crowned, see him glad, see him is standing before you on the wedding day is what she's exhorting them to see. And it's that, what, it's that which I call the bridal paradigm of the kingdom. Jesus is revealed to her as a safe Savior. The only safe place for our hearts is in context to 100% obedience. Again, it's the issue. It's not just how much it costs us to obey. It's how much it costs us in terms of enjoying the fascination of Jesus. How much it costs us in the experience of the superior pleasures. How much it cost us in our inner man shriveling up in spiritual atrophy. How much does it cost us to disobey needs to be the question of the hour. It cost us so much to disobey. The only safe place is going with him on whichever mountain he's beckoning us to in whichever season of our life. Whatever is the high place in that season is the safe place. The promise of safety focuses primarily on spiritual safety that protects her heart. In a secondary way, it speaks of protecting us physically and in terms of our earthly circumstances. This is very important. Jesus never guaranteed that our physical uh, body and our physical circumstances would be perfectly safe in this life. That's why there's martyrs. He has promised to protect us in those arenas in many ways. But He's never promised 100% that all of our stuff would be safe and all of our money would increase. He never said that. Some 
people try to present the gospel as that's the primary mode of safety. The, there is promises of safety that touch our physical body, that touch our, our circumstances. But those promises, though they have a earthly, a very significantly earthly counterpart, your body is perfectly safe in the resurrected body and your treasure is safe forever in heaven. All your circumstances are, and in that, pl- in that way, that's the highest place of safety, physically and circumstantially. But in this age, though, he does promise us uh, degrees of safety, and it's different in, in, in different people's lives, in different circumstances. Again, the martyrs are proof of that. The real place of safety is the safety of our heart. He's saying this, in essence, if you follow me, you will be glad and exhilarated in your inner man. Your inner man will be filled with life. Your inner man will be fascinated and exhilarated. You will have the power to feel loved and the power to love back and the power to translate your earthly life into eternal glory and riches if you will follow me. He promises safety in the full sense of the inner man. He promises safety in conditional ways and in partial ways to our outer man and our circumstances, though very substantial. I don't want to minimize those in any way. Because there's many people in the kingdom of God that just that look down at that and completely ignore that dimension of the gospel. It's a very significant one. But there's others that exalt it unduly. Our safety is primarily spiritual in this age. I tell you what, I'll die a martyr any day with the promise that my heart can be tenderized and filled with love during my life on the earth. Filled with revelation, fascinated. That's the safety of the high place he promises. I love what Jesus said in... In Luke 21, he says, He says, I promise you not one hair of your head will perish. Though they kill you, not one hair of your head will perish. He's talking about the resurrection, for real, for specifically. He says, oh yeah, they may kill you, but not one hair of your head will perish. He says, every single dimension of your body will be restored to you in the resurrection. I promise you that is what Jesus said. And then they killed Jesus. And they killed John the Baptist and right on through history. So it's the spiritual safety is the primary thing that we're talking about. But I tell you, we want large hearts, don't we? God's restoring the vision of a large heart to his people in these days. E, this section proves to be a significant revelation that she prepares... Chapter 4 is when her commitment goes into a whole other dimension. She is absolutely fearless in her commitment from chapter 4 on. And it's the revelation of the safe Savior. The one that promises to exhilarate her and to protect her heart each step of the way. Doesn't mean that she won't be hurt through disappointment in natural circumstances. But spiritually she will be fascinated and exhilarated if she will stay in the place of the Lord. She'll stay in the way of the Lord and say yes to Him. Here's the dilemma. Many of the earthly authority figures in our life have not been safe in their leadership over our lives. So the enemy lies to us continually about Jesus's, about Jesus, our, the ultimate, our ultimate authority figure. And the enemy tells us that he is not a safe leader. We can only see him, we can only fully see him, let's say it that way, as safe from the point of view of eternity. Revelation 19, verse 7, on the last day, every single one of the redeemed say, we rejoice and we are glad over the way you led us through history. Every one of us will be glad and rejoice when we see the end of the matter. And we will proclaim that he was safe. The Holy Spirit asks a question. In my opinion, it's the Holy Spirit. It's the, it's, the, it's the young bride that is speaking as well, but she's speaking, I believe, out of the overflow of the revelation. Uh, you can't have, uh, there's no uh, precision, no uh, uh, final certainty as to who's asking the question, but we know it's a, it's a good question. It's a question that comes from God. And whether it's in the lips of the young bride or uh, therefore it has to come from the Holy Spirit first. If it ever reaches her lips, it had to be given to her. Here's the rhetorical question. The one with the obvious answer. Who is this coming up out of the wilderness? Of course, it's Jesus. Like pillars of smoke, perfumed with myrrh and frankincense, with all the merchants' fragrant powders. The the ascension of Jesus after his incarnation and crucifixion is being...
Sonic of the Space, 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 the Space